if you have no idea what that is, um, that is from March Madness. Those are like some of the crazy highlights. Any March Madness fans? Anybody have no idea what March Madness is? That's okay. You're going to learn tonight. So if, you, if you're not aware, tomorrow March Madness kicks off. March Madness is going to start tomorrow. And what March Madness is, is this big basketball tournament, NCAA. There's 64 teams all competing for one trophy. So it's like playoff basketball for the next two weeks, and it's insane. It's like a bunch of underdogs starting from like the ground up. Nobody thought they could win a game, and then they go and dominate, and they go and win the championship. So March Madness, it is this really cool thing, and everybody gets a chance to fill out a bracket. The brackets look like this. 64 teams, 64 slots, all competing for the one trophy. Even if you're not a basketball fan, like me personally, not a big basketball fan. So even if you're not a basketball fan, it's super fun to fill out a bracket because it's just one and done. Once that team loses, they're out. And then it's cool to track your team that you pick to go all the way throughout from round one all the way up to the championship. So how it works is you fill out a bracket and then you pick a team. Uh, for example, like if we picked uh, Duke, you know, if we picked the team Duke, we would write Duke in a slot, and then we would follow along as they win each game. They would go from the first round, second round, Sweet 16, Elite 8, Final Four, then Championship. So each specific team has a path to the championship. Now, if we're going to keep using Duke for example. If Duke was like, man, I really want this championship. You know, we're a little down. We just got beat by NC State. You know, we haven't won a championship in five years. Like, it's really rough. And like, if Duke is saying, yeah, any Duke fans in here? We'll pray for you. Anybody not a Duke fan? There we go. People are like, I don't even know basketball. I just wanted to raise my hand. Um, but like, for example, if Duke said, look, we haven't won a championship in five years. We really want to win a championship. We got to bring a championship for the home team. Duke really wanted a championship. And then so Duke would look at their bracket, and then they would, they would look at the path that they have to the bracket. Now, what if Duke said, like, hey, this path looks a little too difficult. I'm going to create my own schedule that's just a little bit easier for me to get to the championship, and I want all the other 63 teams to be okay with it. That wouldn't work. Like the NCAA, the people who create the tournament, the NCAA would step in and be like, hey, no, sorry, man, you can't create your own path to the championship. You got to do what we align for you, and you have this one path to get to the championship. And I say all that to say because tonight, as we talk about our week three of frequently asked questions, we're going to see that we all have a path to a championship, so to speak, or to heaven, to eternal life. We all have a path to eternal life. We are in week three of our Frequently Asked Question series, and tonight we're going to answer these two questions. Do all paths lead to heaven, and do you have to affirm of somebody else's path in order to love them? Those are going to be the two questions that we tackle tonight. And what I mean is, like, because I, I hear this a lot growing up in church, I'm a Christian. What I hear people tell me, and I also witness this, hey, man, you're a Christian. You, you're not allowed to judge me. You're supposed to love me. The Bible says you have to love me. So who are you to tell me that this is wrong? Who are you to tell me I should not live my life this way? Who are you to tell me, because you're supposed to love me, that this path that I'm on is not the right one? Like, if you have to love me the way the Bible says you're supposed to love me, then you should affirm of this lifestyle because it's what I like to do. So tonight we're going to tackle that question. And those are some heavy questions, right? Do all paths lead to eternal life? Like maybe you've been living the last 20-something years of your life living one way just to find out there's a dead end at the end of that path. Like that's a big, big reality. Or do you have to affirm of somebody else's belief or lifestyle? Like maybe you're here tonight and you're either wrestling with it for yourself uh, with other people trying to affirm your lifestyle or your belief or you may personally know somebody right now and you're trying to navigate those conversations. Like that's a very, very heavy question. Because I hear it a lot. And that's something that's very applicable with our generation is that we tie affirmation with love. Like, hey, because you're a Christian, you're supposed to love me. And who are you to tell me that this lifestyle of homosexuality is wrong? Who are you to tell me that this lifestyle of getting drunk is wrong? This lifestyle of smoking, of witchcraft, of polygamy. Like who are you to tell me that this is wrong if this is what makes me happy. So you need to accept me as I am because that's what the Bible says you have to do in order to love me. And we, we tie affirmation with love, but we're going to see tonight how to navigate that. I just want to pause for a second because those are some very, very he heavy things. And before you just drown me out and be like, oh my gosh, this dude's about to just tick me off because he's going to tell me I'm wrong and he's not going to affirm my lifestyle and I just make you really mad, my goal is not to make you mad. 
It's not. It's to either, if you're not a believer, to point you to truth, or if you are a Christian, equip you to navigate this conversation to point others to truth. My goal is not to make you mad, but it's simply to be a road sign that says, hey, that way's truth, and to equip you to be a road sign to point other people to go towards truth. So if you just stay with me for the next 30 minutes, you will have the answers you need to navigate those two questions. We're going to see that you can know the Bible and not be a Christian. We're going to see that love shows compassion and points to truth. And we're going to see that there is only one path to heaven. If you have your Bibles tonight, we're going to be in John chapter 8. We're going to be in John chapter 8. And to kind of set this up really quick, where we're going to be at in John chapter 8, this is at the end of Jesus, towards the end of Jesus' public ministry. So Jesus did a lot of public ministry, blessing a lot of people, healing a lot of people, doing a lot of miracles. Where we're here in John chapter 8 is towards the end of his public ministry, leading up to the Last Supper, then eventually the cross. And you're going to see there's a lot of people here at play in this encounter with Jesus. We're going to see Jesus in this story. We're also going to see some Pharisees. We're going to see some scribes. We're going to see a woman. And just to, to break this down, so before we enter this encounter that people have with Jesus, you guys need to understand what a Pharisee and a scribe is. So a Pharisee, it means separated one. The Pharisees separated themselves from society to study and teach the law. The law is referring to the law of Moses or the Torah. The first five books in, your Old Te- in the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that was known as the law. A, a Pharisee or a scribe would have grown up memorizing all of it. Like they knew all the verses, big Bible brains, they knew the law or your first five books in the Old Testament. So they separated themselves from society and also from common people because they considered themselves religiously unclean. So Pharisees wanted nothing to do with just your average Joe type of people. They thought they were religiously unclean. They weren't holy. Pharisees thought they were better than them because they knew the law. They knew the scriptures. Scribes had also knowledge of the law. They were the Bible wizards. They had all the laws and scrolls memorized. So Pharisees and scribes, they knew it all. And then we're going to see Jesus, who also knows the entire Bible because he's God. Pretty cool. And a woman at play. So we're going to be in John chapter 8, starting in verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, placing her in the midst. They said to him, Teacher, this woman had been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, referring to the Torah, the first five books in your Old Testament, the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Then Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. So where we're at here, Jesus comes down from the mountain. He's coming down to teach people, just, just, just normal teaching. He's not going out seeking any trouble. He's not out looking for problems. Scribes and Pharisees roll in. They bring this woman and say, hey, look, Jesus, this person was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses said we're supposed to command, uh, stone her. What do you have to say? See, the mission of the Pharisees and the scribes, like they wanted any type of accusation they could get to punish Jesus or to arrest Jesus. They were just looking for a crack in the door to arrest Jesus. So we're going to see our first point right here, and this is where we're going to know that you can know the Bible and not be a Christian. Non-Christians know the Bible and will try to trap you with it. The Pharisees were using the law of Moses. The Pharisees were using Bible verses to try to trap Jesus. It was in uh, verse 4 and 5. They said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you got to say about it? This is referring to Deuteronomy 22, 22. That says this, If a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge evil from Israel. So the Pharisees go to Jesus like, hey, by, by the way, the Bible says we're supposed to kill this woman. What do you have to say about it? And there we can see non-Christians will use the Bible to try to trap you. But hey, this person just came out as gay. Like, what's the Bible have to say about it? Like, what do you got to say about it? This person just got drunk Friday night. Like, what do you got to say about it? And use the Bible to trap you. And we're going to see how to navigate that answer later. The world, what this means is the world will turn to you for an answer. So they go to Jesus and say, hey, look, what do you got to say about it? That the world will turn to you for an answer. So they may try to trap you with the Bible, but then they're going to turn to you for 
an answer. Jesus was just sitting there. Jesus didn't go out looking for a problem. Jesus didn't go to the scribes and Pharisees and say, hey, guys, you got any problems I need to address today? Jesus was just sitting there teaching them. Almost like if you're a Christian and your friends know you're a Christian, you're just sitting there, maybe in your dorm room, you're at work, minding your own business, then people come up to you, hey, can you believe they posted that on Instagram? Like, I thought they were a Christian. Hey, what do you got to say about it? Like, hey, I heard you go to church on Sunday because I saw you repost the worship night. This person just got drunk past sat- uh, last Saturday. What do you got to say about it? You know, this political debate just happened between the Democrats and Republicans. Like, what do you got to say about it? Where do you land on this political issue? Like, they're going to turn to you for an answer. And we're going to see how Jesus answered this and navigated it. But you can know the Bible and not be a Christian. This means that the world will point out other people's mistakes, but be blinded by their own. John 8, verse 3 says, The scribes and Pharisees brought out a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst. Like, the, the scribes and Pharisees didn't get Jesus and like, hey, let's just talk about it in a quiet room. Like, just imagine that for a second. There's more than four people here. Jesus is teaching people. So there's a crowd of people. Now there's Pharisees and scribes, and they don't roll alone. They usually roll with a group of people. So there's not just like four people, and they're having a private meeting. The Pharisees and scribes take the woman and make an object out of her. Say, hey, look, Jesus, this person, and they bring the woman in front of the crowd. Other translations say in front of the group. So that the scribes and Pharisees bring the woman in front of the group to make an object out of her. Like, hey, this girl was caught in adultery. Like, she did it. She was caught in adultery. Jesus, what do you say about it? To make an object out of the woman. But what the Pharisees didn't know is that they were too blinded to see their own mistakes. Almost like if we say, hey, is that us for a second? Like, is that, could that be you? Like, hey, guys, look at this person. They cuss a lot. Everybody see them? I'm going to pull them out in front of the crowd. Does everybody see this person? They got really drunk last night. Do you guys see them? Oh, hey, they just came out as gay. Do you guys see them? Look at them. Look at them. Could that be us? Oh, wait, you didn't see it, so let me repost it real quick. Let me create a separate group chat to pull that person away from it, to put you in it so they don't hear us spread rumors about them. Like, could that be us if we're honest? Do we see the mistakes in others while thinking we're better than them, that your sin isn't as dirty as someone else's. I think we sometimes have hidden pride. Just because we have some Bible verses memorized, that's what the Pharisees did. Jesus said this, referring to, uh, he was talking to Pharisees, religious leaders. He said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 5, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly how to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Like before you go and point out anybody else's mess, There's a big tree log in your eye and a small speck in your brother's. You can know the Bible and not be a Christian. And this is important because we can have all the brain knowledge and our heart be far from God. We can have all the brain knowledge. We can have all the Bible verses memorized. We can have the law memorized. But our hearts still be far from God. For us, I think we can either get very prideful or very misled. Very prideful of, hey guys, check me out. I just memorized Genesis 1-1. I got them Bible memorized. Look at me. I'm better than them because I lead a small group. Look at me. I serve in church, so I'm better than them. And we develop a little bit of hidden pride. Or we get misled. We're out there in the world looking for answers. And the first person to quote John 3-16, we think, oh my gosh, they're a 10 out of 10 Christian. Let me follow them because they know John 3-16. Did you guys see that? They know the Bible. Like, and we get so quickly misled. But you can know the Bible and not be a Christian. This is what Jesus said addressing a group of Pharisees. Matthew 15, verse 8. These people honor me with their lips. With their lips, they quote the verses. With their lips, they honor me, but their hearts are far from me. You can know the Bible and not be a Christian. And this is important because if you are not aware, you will address the brain and not the heart. If you're not aware, you will address the brain and, get in, uh, and not the heart. Like if you're navigating this conversation with somebody or navigating this situation with somebody and there's just a little bit of hidden pride, you'll focus just on the brain. Like a situation will come up, hey, what do you got to say about this? What do you got to say about that? What's your thoughts on this? And then the, the brain will, will, will attack the brain. It'll turn into a Bible verse debate. They'll quote a scripture, then you quote a scripture, and then you miss the heart. I see us do it all the time. Not just our, our specific group, us as in the church, our generation. We like to flex the Bible brain muscle. Like a, a specific topical issue will, will arise, like drinking, smoking, physical boundaries, homosexuality, heterosexuality. 
or theological conversations with heaven, hell, salvation, free will, predestination. Like, there's a lot of topics that we like to discuss. And sometimes it gets into a Bible verse debate to just see who has the most scripture memorized. Like, hey, they quote a scripture, then you feel like you got to quote a scripture, then they quote a scripture, then so you quote a scripture. And because they quoted four Bible verses and you quoted five, you won the debate. But we can miss the heart. And I'm not saying it's not important to know Bible verses. Like, it is so important to memorize the Bible. We're supposed to have the, the scriptures uh, and count engraved in our heart. Like it's, it's beautiful to know the Bible, to know the verses, to study the scriptures, 100%. But if we get caught up in it, we can miss the heart. You can know the Bible and not be a Christian. So let's keep reading. Let's see how Jesus responded to this. So Jesus was aware. He didn't, he didn't, use a, he didn't flex a Bible brain, and he was aware that they were trying to trap him. So let's see how Jesus responds but first i just want to reread verses one through six just so we can put it all together in context so starting john chapter eight verse one it says this but jesus went to the mount of olives early in the morning he came again to the temple and the people came to him and he sat down and taught them so jesus is just teaching them mind his own business the scribes and pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery placing her in the midst they said to him teacher this woman had been caught in the act of adultery now the law in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? This they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Then Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger. So Jesus just off the bat, he didn't look at the adultery woman and be like, come on, girl, like, why are you doing this? You know this is against the law. Like, what are you doing? He didn't look at the Pharisees and be like, oh, wait, you know that scripture? Let me quote another scripture. He bends down and writes on the ground with his finger. Now, we don't know. It's not recorded what he wrote on the ground. There's no record of what he wrote. There's some assumptions you can make. But all Jesus does is he stays silent, and he writes on the ground. Verse 7, and as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them. So just picture that. Group of Pharisees, group of people, maybe in this world today, you're the Christian. Group of, a group of people come up to you and say, hey, what do you got to say about this? You just stay there quiet. Go on the ground, write something. They say, hey, what, what do you got to say about it? Like, are you going to answer me? Like, I asked you a question. What do you got to say about it? And he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw in a stone at her. And once more, he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She says, no one, Lord. It's cool she addresses him as Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and from now on sin no more or leave your life of sin, depending on your translation. Here we can see our second point, that love shows compassion and truth. That throughout all of this, Jesus did not get in a Bible verse debate with the Pharisees. Jesus didn't pull the woman aside and say, look, girl, I told you this was wrong. You know what's gonna happen if they get you caught in this. Just don't get caught next time. Do what you want, just don't get caught. Jesus showed compassion, and he pointed to truth. But what this means is that throwing stones is not compassionate. That sometimes we follow the crowd, and we see the first person to quote a Bible verse, the next thing you know, we're, we're, we're following along with them. Like, hey, this person quoted John 3, 16. They know what they're doing. They're scolding people. They're saying, repent, everybody repent. You're going to burn in hell. They're quoting Bible verses. And the next thing you know, you're standing in the crowd with them holding a the stone. That's what the Pharisees did. They knew the scriptures. And what this looks like is being a Bible thumper. That's, a, that's the common terminology we like to do. Like being a Bible thumper. Like, hey, I told you adultery's wrong. Like, what are you doing? Hey, getting drunk's wrong. What are you doing? And we just like to smack people with the Bible. Like we take that super drastic in to use the Bible as a weapon. We call them Bible thumpers. But the Bible is not a weapon. And the next thing you know, you're throwing stones, and that's not what Jesus did. Love shows compassion and points to truth. But here, this is where Jesus shows us you can love the person and not affirm the sin. So going back, we're going to answer the question of do you have to affirm of somebody else's beliefs or lifestyles in order to love them? Right? The, the common argument I hear is like, you're a Christian. The Bible says you have to love me. The Bible says you can't, you, you can't judge me because that's what the Bible says. And if you judge me or tell me this is wrong, then you're not being a good Christian. You're being a hypocrite. So we're really on the same level so you have to affirm of my lifestyle. But look how Jesus navigates this. Verse 10, he said, Jesus stood up to her and said, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She says, no one, Lord. 
And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Now go on, and this is the key part. Sin no more. So Jesus tells her to sin, sin no more. Like he doesn't say, hey, look, girl, I'm gonna protect you, I'm gonna forgive you, you're not condemned, peace out. No, he says, look, I acknowledge your sin, I acknowledge you were caught in adultery, we're not just gonna blow past that, but I'm still gonna protect you, I'm not gonna let them stone you, I'm not gonna have a harsh Bible debate conversation with you, but just simply go and sin no more. So Jesus loves her. Like he protected her from getting stoned and he forgave her, he didn't condemn her. But then he says, go and sin no more. So he acknowledges that she messed up and that there was sin, but he never affirms the sin and he loves the person. So it is possible to affirm, to love the person and not affirm the sin. He didn't just say, hey, look, girl, whatever makes you happy, if that's the lifestyle you want to choose to live, hey, that's what makes you happy. Go do it. No, he didn't say that. He said, go and sin no more. And I love this beautiful example in this encounter with Jesus, how we can see the balance of loving the person but not affirming the sin. 1 Corinthians 13, 6 says, love does not delight in evil but rejoices in truth. That if you want to display love, it does not delight in evil, it rejoices in truth. What this means is if you've had stones thrown at you, that wasn't Jesus. I can bet many of us have been on the receiving end of what the Pharisees attempted to do and you've had stones thrown at you. Like maybe you confessed a sin struggle in your small group and the next thing you know there's rumors spread about you or you expressed your beliefs, lifestyles, political views and then the next thing you know you're getting DM'd with hateful comments or text messages or you're excluded from the group and because they were a Christian you relate how that Christian treated you to how Jesus loves you or the church cares for you. It's a false view because here we can see that Jesus did not throw stones. So if you've had thro stones thrown at you that wasn't Jesus. We can see that those harmful comments or behaviors do not align with G who Jesus is. Jesus never threw a stone. He showed compassion. He protected, he, he pr protected, forgave, and he pointed to truth. He said, go and sin no more. Love shows, love shows compassion and points to truth. So what does that mean for us, and why is this important? That we should follow what Jesus modeled. Like, that's the answer right there. Like, how do you get equipped to navigate this situation? That's the answer. Jesus modeled it and lived it out for us. Like, how do you navigate loving somebody and not affirming? He's like, hey, look, I'm going to protect you. I'm not going to, you know, get in a Bible verse debate. I'm going to forgive you even. I'm going to have a conversation with you. You got to know, hey, this is sin. I, I can't affirm that sin. Like, just so you know, this sin in your life, getting drunk is a sin. I can't, I can't, I mean, we just call it, got to call it what it is. But I'm still going to protect you still going to love you. You're a human. You're created in the image of God. I'm not going to condemn you. So we can follow what he modeled. Matthew 16, 24 says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So if you want to get equipped, if you want a cause worth dying for, if you want to handle tough conversations, pick up your cross and follow him. Remember, Jesus was just there minding his own business. Same thing with us. If we pick up our cross, minding our own business, the world will come to you for an answer. Because when you pick up your cross, it's going to be uncomfortable. People will be able to see it. You're going to stick out. It's going to be heavy, but it's going to be worth it. If you learn how to navigate that balance, you can change somebody's perspective on who Jesus truly is. Like maybe they had a bad view of Jesus because of imperfect people. That you can be able to change somebody's life and show them who Jesus truly is. Love shows compassion and points to truth. Right? We live in a world today that tells you you need to affirm in order to love. That it's not loving if you don't affirm. But Jesus showed you don't need to. But it's also if you don't, if you do not affirm, that's love. But it's unloving if you do affirm. That if you do affirm, it's really unloving. And we're going to unpack that in a second. It breaks my heart seeing churches, pastors, and other Christians affirm sinful lifestyles. That sin is sin. No matter which way you look at it, sin is sin. And no matter how much people will affirm of sinful lifestyles, it breaks my heart, mainly for the people who get misled. For the, for the pastors and churches and other Christians who affirm sinful lifestyles, my heart breaks for them, but it breaks even, even more for the people who get misled. Because then they're holding hands with somebody as they walk off a cliff thinking they're okay. And my heart breaks for them. And one specific thing I want to give clarity to, just because in our society today, it's a very big 
debate. That homosexuality, it goes from a thought to an action, and that action part is sin. I don't want to camp out on it. just want to give some brief clarity to it. That homosexuality is sin. And it's not greater than or any worse than heterosexual sin, but it is sin. And I personally know of people who struggle with homosexuality. They have the thoughts and the, the attraction, but the action part and acting out on it, they surrender that to God. And I have a deep compassion for them, and I honor them, that they're willing to take that thought captive, surrender that desire to God, and remain abstinent unto the Lord. It is very beautiful, and it's encouraging. And if you have questions about that or like more clarity on that, I don't want to camp out on it, but if you have any questions about that or like more clarity on that, please come talk to me after this. We'd love to talk through the scriptures about what it teaches with homosexuality. But love shows compassion and points to truth. This is important because the Jesus I worship, the Jesus we serve, the Lord of my life, the Jesus we read about, read about in the Bible did not throw stones. I think we get a, a bad rep. Christians get a, get a bad rep, or Jesus get a bad rep for being a Bible thumper. Like we just go around preaching, hey, burn in hell, you do that wrong, burn in hell, repent, 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 repent. And we get a bad rep, but that's not really what Jesus truly exhibited. So what you should do about it is if you need to, pick up your cross, not a stone, and represent Jesus faithfully. Love people, protect people, forgive people, but do not affirm the sin because if you affirm, it's unloving. And if you're hearing this about Jesus and you're realizing that maybe you didn't have a true understanding of who Jesus is or how he handles people and handles conversations and situations with people with real issues you're experiencing the true Jesus to see he is loving, compassionate, forgiving, but he's also pointing people to truth. And if you need to tonight, let Jesus mend your heart. Say, God, this is truly who you are. That's how much you love me. Are you not there to chuck stones at me every time I confess to you? But you're there to accept me with open arms. Let him mend your heart. Psalms 147 verse 3 says, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. This is where we're going to, the last point for tonight is that there's only one path to heaven. So that question of do all paths lead to heaven, the idea of I can believe in whatever God I want, and eventually as long as I'm a good person, I'll end up with eternal life or I'll end up in heaven, and eventually I'll make it to the top. It doesn't matter if it's Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, witchcraft, do all paths lead to heaven? The, the easy answer is no. John 14, 6 said, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Out of all the religions out there, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, there's, there's, there's a thousand out there. Out of all the religions out there, there's only one that leads to heaven. Out of all the religions out there, only, only one has a God that created earth and humanity. Only one has a God that created heaven and hell. Only one has a God that physically came down on earth in flesh and then physically died on a cross and then rose again and walked out of a tomb. And that's the God of Christianity. His name is Jesus. And the only way to eternal life is through him. John 14, 6. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is Jesus talking. So what does it mean to go through Jesus? It means you're looking at the cross to see what Jesus did to say, look, Jesus, you died on the cross for my sins so I could have eternal life. The only thing I have to do is surrender. That's what it means to go through Jesus. And this is important because if you affirm sin, you're telling people it's okay to go around Jesus. If you affirm sin and say, hey, look, girl, it's okay. Look, I don't want to make you mad. I want to do what makes you happy. Now, I'm not going to thump you with the Bible, but hey, this is what makes you mad. I mean, this is what makes you happy. If that's your truth, if that's the life you want to live, that's okay with me. You're letting them know it's okay to try to go around Jesus. And that's not loving because the only way to eternal life is through Jesus. You either have repented and believed or you haven't. Like there is no around option. You either acknowledge Jesus as the Lord of your life and walk in that way, faithfully, not perfectly, but faithfully. There is no around option. There is no A, B, C, or D. Is it through Jesus, by Jesus, in Jesus, around Jesus? It's simply through Jesus, and it is a very narrow path that few find. So what we should do about it, man, if, we have, if you have not placed your faith in Jesus, know that he's there to love you, to accept you, to not condemn you. And the only thing you have to do is surrender to him. No, he desperately wants a relationship with you. And if you are a believer in Jesus, this is how you balance. You warn and teach, not throw stones. Colossians 1.28 says this, Him we proclaim, admonishing or warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, 
so that we may present everyone faithfully mature in Christ. You warn and teach. Like, hey, I'm going to warn you that this is sin, that getting drunk is sin, that homosexuality is sin, that smoking is sin, that lustful heterosexuality is sin. I'm going to warn you of that, but I'm going to teach you the right way. I'm going to point you to Jesus. I'm not just going to warn you and dip out. I'm also not just going to teach you what to do without warning you. That is this balance of warning and teaching. It is a beautiful balance. So to recap all this, you can know the Bible and not be a Christian. The Pharisees tried to trap Jesus using Bible verses. Jesus was aware of that. He didn't get in a Bible verse debate. He didn't try to flex a Jesus muscle, but by his actions, he displayed love. Love shows compassion and points to truth. We can follow what Jesus modeled. He protected her from being stoned. He forgave her. He showed compassion, and then he points towards truth. That's love. And there is only one path to heaven, and it is through Jesus. I want to pull back up our uh, March Madness bracket. Abner, if you can throw that bracket up again. But one thing about this March Madness bracket is if you look at it specifically enough, there's 64 teams, 64 different options. If you're the Duke team, then you got a path to the championship. But that also means there's 60 other three paths to the championship. And that's a false reality. You can keep the bracket up, Abner. That there's 64 different ways to get to a championship. And we see that here on earth. Like, man, there's 64 different options to get to eternal life. Like, this is, this is great. Like, I can choose whatever religion I want. And eventually, I just got to win a couple games and I'm there. I just got to be a good person and I'm there. And that's a very false reality. That out of those 64 different uh, paths or, or religions out there, there is only one that leads to eternal life. Here today, there's a lot of different religions, false doctrines, half Christians, and it looks like there's 64 different options you could choose from to eventually end up on the winning team, but there is only one, and it's through Jesus. Answering those two questions, do you have to affirm of somebody's lifestyles or beliefs in order to love them? The answer is no. Do all paths lead to heaven? The answer is no, right? But that response, if you're a Christian, you're supposed to love me. Who are you to judge me? You're supposed to love this lifestyle. It's like watching them hang out on the wrong path, like, oh, you're on the other team trying to end up in that championship, and you're holding their hand as they walk off this cliff, thinking they're okay because they can go around Jesus, and eventually they fall off that cliff, and then they look back at you to say, look, you knew the truth. You knew the right path. You knew the right way to actually end up in eternal life, and you didn't want to say nothing to me. Like, imagine that reality, that it's unloving if we don't, it's unloving to affirm. I want to give that, uh, make that a burden for us, that as we navigate life, it's okay to call sin, sin in a loving, compassionate way, because we know the truth. Man, our job here as Christians, we got two signs in our hand. We got one sign that says, dead end, don't go this way, cliff ahead. And that's the other th 63 options. Hey, don't go this way. If you go this way, there's a dead end. There's a cliff at the end of this. In the other hand, we get a road sign that says, go to Jesus. That's the other way. Go that way. And here on earth, as we live out our, our, our lives here on earth, that's what we're out to do. That's our job. Hey, don't go this way. Go to Jesus. He's the one with the eternal life. That's the path you want to go on. Believe what you want. No matter how you feel, there's nothing that's going to change the reality of there's only one way to heaven. And if that if we affirm people's different options or different paths, it's unloving because they're, they're going to sit at the bottom of that cliff to say, look, you could have told me, man. Why don't you give me the heads up? Like you knew the truth, but you were just scared to tell me? And you said you're my brother or my sister and that you love me? Love tells the truth. Love tells the truth. So tonight I want to end. I want to ask our uh, leaders to come on up and our prayer team. So tonight my hope is these two things. I hope you were able to see Jesus as he truly is. That he's not the God who just chucks stones at people. He's not the God that's just like, burn in hell, you're all going to die. Like, that's not the Jesus we read about. Now, God is holy. He's gracious. He's loving. And he's holy. He's all three of those things. Because he is holy, there is a very big reality that we're all going to have an account among to him. And that if we're not covered by the blood of Jesus... The only other eternal option in heaven is hell. You can rewatch uh, re that week one sermon about hell. But tonight, if you're here tonight, maybe you're getting a true vision of who Jesus is, that he actually is a loving God. He's not throwing rocks at you. 
that if you confess to him, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness, and that he wants a relationship with you so, so bad, that he doesn't want to look at you and say, oh, how could you have done this again? I tried to tell you, like, shame on you. Like, that's not who he is. Or tonight, if you're realizing that maybe the path you're on has a dead end at the end of it, know that there is one with an eternal life in Jesus, and the only thing you have to do is surrender to him. You don't have to fight. You don't have to beg. You don't have to work. You just got to surrender. Or tonight, if you're here, my hope is that you are now equipped to navigate this situation with others, that maybe you understand this balance just a little bit better, that you don't have to get on one huge drastic side of, of being a Bible thumper or a Pharisee to say, shame on you. How could you have done that? I'm better than you. I got scriptures memorized. Get your stuff together. Or the whole other drastic side of, you know, there's so much love, grace, and freedom. It doesn't matter about your sin. Do whatever you want. Maybe we can navigate this balance just a little bit better of warning and teaching. So if you're here and you just want to have a follow-up conversations, that's what they're here for. If you want more clarity on this message or anything we talked about, please come ask me. Uh, but I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll dip out. Father, thank you for tonight. Jesus, I pray we see you as, as you truly are, that you are a God that displays love, grace, and holiness. That is loving to point towards the truth. Father, I pray if there's anybody here tonight realizing that the path they're on is a dead end, draw them close to you and point them to you, point them to the cross. Let them know that they only have to go through Jesus, not around. God, I pray that you equip us all to navigate this situation with a little bit more grace and a lot more holiness, that we can warn and teach. If there's anybody in our life or any current situations where we feel like we have to affirm to love, remind us that love rejoices in truth. In your name we pray. Amen.